My name is Cheryl Brunkish, President of Phoenix Holocaust Association and Chair of the Community Advisory Board of Gen Genocide Awareness Week. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome each of you here tonight to our program. As a partnership of Holocaust survivors, their descendants, and the larger community, Phoenix Holocaust Association honors the memory and legacy of the survivors and victims, promotes awareness of the Holocaust, provides education of this and other genocides, and contributes to Tikkun Alum, Repair of the World. Let me take a moment to thank my fellow board members and volunteers who are here with us this evening in person and those watching from home. It is, on, it is my honor to have in our audience tonight uh, at least four Holocaust survivors that I said hello to. And of course, they are our most honored guests today. And I want to acknowledge the presence here of two uh, other leaders of Yahad et Nunam, in addition to Father Dubois, who I know that's who you came to hear. Um, but we have Marco Gonzalez and Eva Schaller here. And unfortunately, well, you all know our Holocaust survivors are aging, and we are so blessed to have somewhere around 60 living in the valley. Um, but we lost a Holocaust survivor last night, and one that many people uh, know, uh, Gerda Weissman Klein, who was 98, died last evening. Uh, Gerd is one of the most well-known Holocaust survivors, both locally, nationally, and internationally. I think you know she won an Oscar for a short film, One Survivor Remembers. And she also uh, is the um, honoree or winner of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest civilian honor uh, someone can get in this country. So, sad news, but it makes what we do even more important. I hope you've had the opportunity to visit the Hayden Library to experience the powerful exhibit, Holocaust by Bullets. The exhibit showcases the meticulous research uncovering the step-by-step -step nature of the crimes committed against Jews and others by Nazi killing units. Holocaust by Bullets opened at the end of February, and since that time, many thousands of people have had the opportunity to visit the exhibit. It's here through April 17th, and we encourage all of you to make time to visit. The library is open to the public until 10 tonight, so you can even go after tonight's program. So we are here tonight on opening day of the 10th annual Rosenbluth Family Charitable Foundation Genocide Awareness Week which for the very first time is hosted here on the ASU campus. Phoenix Holocaust Association is proud to be a partner of Genocide Awareness Week. And I wanna thank Arizona State University and the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies for their leadership in developing an outstanding conference. At the conclusion of Father Patrick Dubois' presentation, there will be a question-answer session with our speaker. As you entered this evening, you were given the opportunity to take a card, and you can write your questions, and then uh, somebody will collect them. Um, volunteers will come probably down both aisles to collect questions. And now I'm pleased to introduce Jeffrey Cohen, Dean of Humanities in the College of 
Liberal Arts and Sciences to say a few words. Dean Cohen. Sorry. Thanks, Cheryl. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We're so happy to have you with us this evening. I'm Jeffrey Cohen, Dean of Humanities in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences here at ASU. We have over 4,000 undergraduate majors studying the humanities, from history to philosophy to linguistics, film, religious studies, and literature across many languages, from English and Spanish to American Sign Language and Hebrew. I oversee three large schools and a community of 350 faculty members. Almost 30,000 seats are filled in humanities courses in a given semester. We aim to be a national model for how the humanities should be practiced. I've served as dean for four years now, and it's been a wonderful four years, but I can honestly say that there's nothing during my time as dean that has made me prouder than supporting my colleagues in shippers and Jewish studies, bringing Genocide Awareness Week to our campus. I'm grateful to all of them, especially because what we have accomplished through its location here so well fulfills the ASU Charter of Access and Inclusion. Genocide will never stop recurring until we remember and better understand its insistent repetitions. We live in a diminished world because there are some lessons we have not learned and therefore lives families, and communities that have come to their end. Having Genocide Awareness Week here and hosting Holocaust by Bullets in the library matters profoundly. Thousands of students see the exhibit every day, and no education is complete without understanding the expansiveness of the Holocaust, the per pervasiveness of genocide. I'm trained as a medievalist, and I know very well that the distant past is never all that distant. We turn to history to guide us in building more just futures and to honor those who have come before us. Tonight, that especially means honoring the memory of those who have perished or been affected by genocide. Thanks for joining us. It's now my pleasure to introduce Mary Jane Rind President and CEO of the Virginia Piper Charitable Trust, without which so much of what ASU has achieved would not have been possible. Tonight, she represents the Rosenbluth Family Charitable Foundation, lead sponsor of Genocide Awareness Week, as well as a major donor to the Phoenix Holocaust Association, Holocaust by Bullets programming. Thank you. Dean Cohen, thank you. That was a very warm introduction and I, I really appreciate that and especially appreciate that ASU is a partner in Genocide Awareness Week. My sincere thanks to you, Cheryl, and to everyone associated with the Phoenix Holocaust Association for including me and the Rosenbluth Family Charitable Foundation in this special program. It's truly an honor to be here with all of you representing both Jerry and the foundation. Jerry just loved this community and he had strong beliefs about supporting it. And he was especially dedicated to contributing to efforts that honored his Jewish heritage. Jerry also just loved his work and he worked hard, very hard. He lived relatively modestly, thoughtfully accruing wealth that he was adamant about sharing with others through charitable giving with 60% of the foundation's funds being designated to advancing education about and engagement with Jewish causes. That's why we think that he would be thrilled with the idea of Rosenbluth Family Charitable Foundation sponsoring this 10th annual Genocide Awareness Week. We are really grateful to have this dedicated week where we can come together, learn from the horrific violence of the past, how it can inform discussions and solutions for ongoing threats of global genocide. And it is so wonderful to have Father Dubois here with us tonight. 
and I want to spare, share a special connection that Jerry and I have to him that he doesn't even know about. Jerry's brother and sister-in-law, Bill and Jean Rosenbluth, met Father on a trip sponsored by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. They absolutely raved about him. They talked about his genuine dedication to humanity, his remarkable work as a human rights activist, working tirelessly to fight bigotry and help bridge divides between faiths. I wanted to meet him for years, and tonight that dream finally came true. Father Dubois, as you know, is a founder of Yehada Newman, which means Together in One, an amazing nonprofit committed to uncovering genocidal practices globally, working on behalf of past and present victims of mass murder as a leading voice of protest. Organizations like Yehada Newman and the Holocaust Association are those that the Rosenbluth Family Charitable Foundation is very proud to support. As some of you may know, I'm a cradle Catholic, so it brings me great joy that a priest has done so much work to uncover additional atrocities committed by Nazis during the Holocaust. I am also thrilled that Father Dubois has expanded the work of Yehad and Unum so that it can discover and prosecute other vile genocidal practices. On behalf of the Rosenbluth Family Charitable Foundation, I sincerely commend Father Dubois and his entire organization for their work. I'm thrilled to be in their presence tonight. Now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Rich Casper. He's the CEO of both the Jewish Community Foundation of Greater Phoenix and the Jewish Federation of Greater Phoenix. With a combined 130 years of support to the community, these two organizations focus on local Jewish philanthropy and support for a vibrant, enduring Jewish community. Will you help me get down? <laughs> MJ, thank you and good evening everyone. After more than two years of pandemic Zooming, I am delighted to be here tonight in person <clears throat> to celebrate Father Dubois' visit to Phoenix and to participate in the first Genocide Awareness Week at ASU. As some of you know, the Jewish Community Foundation of Greater Phoenix and the Jewish Federation of Greater Phoenix have recently integrated their operations in order to capitalize on our complementary business models and overlapping missions. By bringing these two organizations together, we hope to enhance our combined strengths and resources to better serve and impact our diverse Jewish community in the Valley. One way that we will continue to support our community is to award grants to a variety of organizations in Greater Phoenix and in Israel. This year, the Foundation and the Jewish Federation conducted a single unified grant cycle for our community, allocating nearly one and a half million dollars to fund programs such as Holocaust by Bullets and Genocide Awareness Week. As anti-Semitic and other hate crimes continue to rise in Arizona and in the United States, Programs like these are so important to raise awareness and educate the community so we can help to address these critical issues. And with the new state legislation mandating Holocaust education in our schools, these programs provide opportunities for students to see, to hear, and to learn about the Holocaust and other genocides outside of the classroom. Being here at ASU and with the Phoenix Boys Choir about ready to perform, we're reminded of the importance of sharing these important stories with future generations so that we never forget the dangers of prejudice, discrimination, and dehumanization. That to be an upstander, not a bystander, means knowing that the power of resistance, resilience, and solidarity leads to awareness and action. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the Phoenix Boys Choir under the direction of artistic director Herbert Washington for a short program that reminds us of the unifying message of music.
first piece that we sang for you is called Inscription of Hope, and those words were scrawled on a cellar wall um, by Jews who were hiding from the Nazis during the Second World War. Then we're going to move to another, a piece that is actually in Hebrew. Uh, we're going to be joined by one of your very own, Hisana Summers, who's here at ASU on violin. And this piece talks about um, the same idea that I believe, right? I believe in the Father. And, and, uh, and so we will share that, and this is in Hebrew. And then you're going to have some speakers that come up and really talk about this piece, which is titled Ani Ma Amin. Our song, Ani Ma Amin, is an ancient Hebrew affirmation of faith. The text, which is centuries old, can be interpreted as follows. I believe in God, in a greater truth, and in things greater than this world in spite of all that has happened. I believe that the Messiah will come, and he will find me waiting, no matter how long he tarries, no matter how long he delays his coming. I will continue to believe. No matter what the future holds, I believe. The song had a rich history in the heart of Israel. It gained its greatest significance, however, during the Holocaust. Thousands of Jews entered the gas chamber, singing this very song, proclaiming allegiance to God under their last breath. Eyewitness accounts tell us that the music would decrescendo to the silence, only as the gas choked the singers. The song had a, has a rich history in the heart of Israel. No matter how long he tarries, he will find me waiting. Today we sing Ani Ma Amin out of respect for the faith for which so many millions of children died. Today we sing Ani Ma Amin knowing that if we join hands and hearts and voices and sing the songs of those who suffer, we will learn that, while we may be different, we are truly beautiful. And if we, the children of the world, value all other children as beautiful people, we can prevent such atrocities from happening again in our lifetimes. This is why we sing. This is what we believe.
The Phoenix Boys Choir was greeted by a Holocaust survivor, um, which is, in my lifetime, the very first one that I've ever had the, the pleasure of, of meeting and interacting with. And for these boys, I know that that is probably their very first. And there's about, there's only 80 Holocaust survivors in Arizona. And um, uh, his name is Oscar Knobloch, and he came to, and some of you uh, know that name, and he came to speak because he's been speaking all around the world. He just travels and he loves to share his, thank you very much, he loves to share his story. And he talked about his story, but more importantly about what we should do to eradicate hate and what we should do to have um, less racism and less violence. So he, he preached about um, sharing the idea of being an upstander, not a bystander, and that really resonated with us. And so uh, tonight, there is a, a piece that we want to sing for you, which is the Partisan Hymn. And we're going to sing it in English uh, today, and I, there may be text, there may be words, I don't know if it's going to be on the screen or not, but we're going to sing it for you. And uh, this is very well known, um, and so I want to first thank uh, ASU, um, from the Phoenix Boys Choir, thank you, Volker Venkert and Cheryl Brockish, and as, uh, as well as the whole uh, history department for having the Phoenix Boys Choir here. Um, this has been quite a treat. We've learned so much from this uh, opportunity, and so we, um, we wish you all the best. Um, thank you for Father Dubois. We can't wait to hear Father Dubois, and so thank you for having us here today, and please enjoy the Partisans Hymn. Thank you, Artistic Director Herbert Washington and the Phoenix Boys Choir for your incredibly moving performance and beautiful pieces performed this evening. 
including inscription of hope. This profoundly moving text put to music by composer Z. Randall Stroop, who received a doctorate from Arizona State University. Ani Mamin, I believe, has historically been recited by Jews at the conclusion of morning prayers. Zognit, a song written in Yiddish, considered a chief anthem of Holocaust survivors. Thank you for being here this evening. My name is Amy Cohn, a region advisor for the Western lay leadership of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And along with my husband, Andrew, a grateful supporter of Genocide Awareness Week. Tonight's keynote speaker, Father Patrick Dubois, is a Roman Catholic priest and founder and president of Yahad in Unum, translation together in one. He is also a distinguished professor at Georgetown University and world-renowned human rights activist. Father Dubois has devoted his life to confronting anti-Semitism. For him, it was very personal. His grandfather was a French soldier deported to a prison camp in a small village of Ukraine that borders Poland. Decades later, Father Dubois visited his grandfather's prison camp to pay his respects to the lives lost. When he first arrived, he had no knowledge that Jews had been killed there. Upon learning of these systematic massacres, he was struck by the total absence of any memorial to honor the 15,000 Jews who perished at the hands of the mobile killing squads. Since 2004, with the founding of Yahad and Unum, Father Dubois, along with a team of researchers, has worked tirelessly to identify and memorialize the unnamed mass murders at the sites where Jews and Roma, also known as gypsies, were killed by Nazis and local collaborators. These mobile killing squads, known as Eitzengruppen, killed over two million Jewish people across Eastern Europe. Father Dubois' work is featured in the exhibit Holocaust by Bullets, which is currently on display at ASU's Hayden Library. As Cheryl said, it will be open till 10 p.m. if you would like to go view it. This is the second showing of this significant exhibit in Arizona, the first being at the Arizona State Capitol in January 2020. Father Dubois has expanded our knowledge of the magnitude of murders during the Holocaust and has committed himself to exposing these truths for generations to come. Not only has Father Dubois discovered over 3,100 execution sites of previously unidentified graves, but he has also interviewed over 7,400 eyewitnesses who watched their neighbors slaughtered by Nazis. More recently, Father Patrick Dubois also leads Action Yazidis, collecting testimony from survivors to document the genocide of Yazidis by ISIS. Father Dubois is the former head of the Commission for the Relations with Judaism for the French Bishops' Conference and consultant to the Vatican. He's been featured on CBS's 60 Minutes, has authored several best-selling books, and received a number of merits of distinction, including the Legion of Honor from French President Nicolas Sarkozy, the Medal of Valor from the Simon Wiesenthal Center, the Humanitarian Award from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and he holds honorary doctorates from Hebrew University, Bar Ilan University, and New York University. We will now watch a short video to learn more about Father Patrick Dubois and Yahad and Unum.
tout a commencé dans un petit village euh, en Ukraine, Ravaruska. Vous savez euh, qu'il y avait beaucoup de Juifs euh, avant la Deuxième Guerre mondiale et on se demandait qu'est-ce qui s'est passé avec les Juifs puisqu'aujourd'hui il n'y a personne. En fait, ils ont été amenés au milieu de la forêt et ils ont été assassinés, fusillés. Et puis on a découvert que les Juifs n'étaient pas enterrés, que personne ne savait où c'était, que personne ne voulait parler, que tout le monde disait il n'y a jamais eu de fusillade. Et c'est comme ça que nous avons commencé à enquêter pour trouver les preuves de ces assassinats des Juifs et des Tziganes. Et depuis 16 ans, eh bien, on frappe à la porte et on demande est-ce que vous étiez là, madame Et est-ce que vous étiez là, monsieur Et si la personne répond oui, eh bien, on essaie de sauver la mémoire de l'Europe. Nous avons collecté plus de 7000 témoignages. Je dirais que c'est un challenge difficile parce qu'il a fallu admettre que finalement les voisins des Juifs ou des Tziganes sont contents parce qu'ils auront la maison, parce qu'ils auront les filles, parce qu'ils auront l'argent, les bijoux, les chaussures. Il y a toujours des angles morts dans les, dans, les, dans les génocides, dans les crimes de masse, dans les crimes en général. Et nous, notre mission, c'est aussi d'aller dans ces angles morts-là. C'est ça qui nous a amené dans les petits villages des peuples Kiché au Guatemala. Selon les historiens, il a eu entre 250 000 et 500 000 victimes. Là encore, on a interviewé des femmes, des hommes qui ont survécu. Je me souviens de cette femme qui était enceinte de 8 mois, qui a été violée euh, alors que l'on tuait son mari et ses autres enfants. Donc ça nous a ouvert à nouveau la zone grise des massacres de masse dont personne ne parle, que tout le monde oublie, parce que c'est pas à la mode, parce que ça n'attire pas les médias. Et puis est arrivé le génocide des Yazidis par Daesh. Lorsque moi-même j'ai vu les images à la télévision, ça m'a paru clair qu'il fallait aller en Irak. D'organisation de recherche, d'organisation de, de recueil de preuves et d'enseignements, on a développé une expertise d'aide aux survivants. Et c'est ça qui nous permet aujourd'hui de pouvoir agir quand il se passe quelque chose dans le monde. Certains sont mobilisés par le réchauffement climatique et c'est très important. Certains par l'écologie et c'est très important. Mais tous les jours aussi, on tue, on égorge, on met des bombes. Une fois c'est à Kaboul, alors bon, Kaboul c'est loin. Une fois c'est au Nigeria, oh ben on ne sait pas trop où c'est. Et puis tout d'un coup, c'est pas loin de Paris. Tout d'un coup, c'est à Nice. Tout d'un coup, c'est à Orlando. Alors là, on est touché. On est touché parce que c'est les voisins. Il faut que chacun prenne ses responsabilités. Yarat, c'est aussi pour connecter d'autres personnes qui dorment mal lorsque l'on tue quelqu'un très loin. Si on continue à bien dormir, on va se réveiller dans un cauchemar. Good evening. You hear me? I don't know if it works. The microphone doesn't seem to work, this one. Now it works. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. It's special to be here because uh, we have many friends already and I know they were training of teachers, exhibit. So we are not in a no man's land when we come in your very nice city. I shouldn't tell you, but uh, Phoenix is a city I prefer in America. 
but don't say that to anybody, please. When I go in another place, I don't say the same. <laughs> I was in Toledo this morning. I didn't say I prefer Toledo. <laughs> and so uh, you are upscale group. Most of you know what we are doing. And so I would like to propose a, a reflection about what we found since 20 years. First, I'm not alone. People think I'm alone, like a priest with an old microphone, you know, a little bit shaking, and uh, making video all over the planet. No, I'm not alone. We built an organization called Yachad, means together, and Inunum in one. So we have always been a certain number. And Marco Gonzalez, that is just behind taking picture, is working with me since 20 years. So you can applaud him because he has been very helpful. <laughs> And Eva, I don't know where she is. She must be discreet somewhere. And uh, she's also working for us and with us since seven years. So we have a group, like 15, 20 in Paris. Me, I am now the old guy. Uh, people, Marco is middle age, And uh, people are like 20, 30 years old. We have one team in Brussels, three, four people, mainly gypsy or people working about Iraq. We have one team in Guatemala because we opened the first Holocaust Museum in Central America. So we have four people there. And we have 18 people working in Iraq in the IDP camps for survivors Yazidi. So since the beginning, as you heard, we have interviewed nearly 8,000 non-Jews present at the shootings of Jews by German or by collaborators. The first thing that you must understand is that the shootings were public. I remember a lady, she told me we were in the class and the director came and said, tomorrow you have no class because we kill our enemies. So you can go and watch and it will be the lesson the day after. So she said that there were 37 children who came up early to go to watch to see the shootings. And they arrived too early. There was no Jew and no German. So they sat under a tree. And suddenly, all the Jews and Germans arrived. And I remember this lady was a grandma. She told me, I cried a lot. I said, OK, you cried a lot. I said, but did you stay during the whole shooting? She told me, yes. I say, why did you stay? And she said something that I heard now hundreds of times. She said, it was interesting for us, the children. So that is something when you work on a genocide like us on the ground, with no camp, no train, no railway, no selection, but shootings and shootings and shootings, people were interested. I learned in, in humanity, we don't accept it, but I learned in humanity that when you are sure it will not be for you, you are not Jew, you are not gypsy, you are not gay, you are not communist, so you go to watch because finally that day you are chosen to be alive. And that you will or not, you are happy to be chosen on the good side and you watch the people chosen on the bad side. I say that because we must stop teaching Holocaust as a secret affair. It has never been secret. I interviewed around Belzec. People were watching with binoculars, people entering in the gas chamber. I investigated around Sobibor. People came behind the camp to see the extraction of, of the corpse from the gas chamber and watching everything. I interviewed around Auschwitz. People climbed above the bridge, the Polish people, to watch the selection. Nothing has been secret. It's a total lie. But it's embarrassing to think it was public. Because me, before, when I began the investigation, I was thinking that if you saw a genocide, you had an empathy for the victim, and you were traumatized for all your life. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I interviewed people who were living in Oshetsin, near the camp. I was thinking it would be weird. They were exactly like you and me. So the first thing to accept 
is that a genocide is inside humanity. It's not on a hell place out of everything. It's not true. It's why people can do it again without any problem. Because as long as you know you are not a victim and you have been under propaganda to see these groups is a bad group, finally, you are chosen to be alive. That's the first thing. The second thing is that Hitler never missed people to do the job. I worked in Ukraine. Oh, people say bad Ukrainian. I worked in Poland. People say, oh, bad Polish. I work in Lithuania. People say, oh, bad Lithuanian. I work in Estonia, bad Estonian. I work in Russia. You cannot say bad Russian because you lose your visa. <laughs> but, um, um, but it's the same. It's the same in every country. There is no country where Hitler say, oh, nobody wants to do the job for killings. No, he found always people. He found always people to do everything, to dig the mass grave, to fulfill the mass grave, and even if Jews are not dead, they are buried alive, to take the belongings and sell them by auction, etc., etc., to bring ashes on the blood with pouring for the mass grave. He found always people. So for me, it's a big question because, you know, I worked in the beginning only in the Holocaust. So we work during, we are still working, we have still two years to investigate. We are raising money to finish because in spite of the war, actually, we want to finish to find the mass grave in Poland and in Baltic country before it's too late. And, uh, you know, unconsciently you say bad Soviet people. They hated the Jews, it was anti-Semite, so it's not surprising that they participated to the genocide. But suddenly, I worked in Iraq about the genocide done by ISIS against the Yazidi. No Polish, no Ukrainian, no Lithuanian. Exactly the same story. The neighbors made a deal with the killers, took the belonging, were very happy to buy girls and sell girls to make money, to buy children and sell children, or to dig the mass grave, or to take pictures of their neighbors being shot. Me, I, I think genocide is a part of humanity that we don't accept it is. We make like if we are not concerned that we are the good people fighting against. But in fact, if we have been Ukrainian in a farm and suddenly you see that you can get the house of the Jew who is owning the small shop for nothing, that's the other part also that I would like you to think. There was no pure anti-Semite crime. The criminals were motivated by anti-Semitism. This German who came from Stuttgart, from Köln, from Munich, from anywhere, and spent three years shooting and shooting and shooting every day, of course they were motivated by, by anti-Semitism and by propaganda. But they never let the belonging of a Jewish family. I never saw an SS shooting Jews and say, I don't care the belonging. The SS was not a non-profit, not at all. And we have now testimonies of many Germans who send the belongings to their wife by the regular post office of Germany. We found a letter of a chief of an ISAS group, and the wife is writing, my darling, this week the carpets are much too large for our apartment. It means the man was packing carpets that he stole in the Jewish houses and sent to Germany. So, third thing also, when we worked East and East, we saw that in every Gestapo, there were Jewish sex slaves. So the first time I learned that, I say, oh, it will be difficult to say, because most of historians say no, because of the racial laws from Hitler, it was forbidden for a German to touch a Jewish girl. And I was in Busk, in a place where we made excavation, and everybody saw that there were 16 or 20 sex slaves in the Gestapo. And working also in the Gestapo to clean the soil, etc. And this woman, at the end, they were all pregnant. 
So the shooters didn't dare to kill them themselves, so they called another unit of German who came and shot them. This was very moving for me because these girls, of course, they were the only survivors. Every Jew was already dead, being shot, and so they knew they would be shot. So they asked, they were put in a truck, and they asked the driver of the truck to turn around the village to say goodbye to everybody. So imagine these girls saying bye-bye to all the population, and everybody knew they would be shot. I remember I wanted to find where these girls have been buried. Nobody wanted to say it. And suddenly a lady approached us and said, me, I can show you uh, where the girls, we say the girls, have been shot. And she was shaking and very afraid of her neighbors, and we found the first mass grave of Jewish girl, sex slave. So I realized also that the Nazi in East, far from Berlin, were killing, stealing, and raping. An anti-Semite criminal is not a pure criminal. It doesn't exist. He says he's pure, but he's not. He's a criminal like any powerful criminal. And after we found sex slaves in every Gestapo, I found a testimony of a German in an archive. He was a soldier in the village where my grandpa was deported in Ravaroska. And he said there was a lunch organized with the, the SS, and he had a friend who was an SS. And the SS proposed him to watch a shooting of Jews. And he said, oh, I'm interesting, I will go. So he went to the building of the SS, where they had their apartments. He, he opened the first room, and he saw an SS making sex with a girl. Second room the same, third room the same, etc. And he opened the last do door, and his friend was an SS, was also with a, a girl. And he, he said this terrible phrase, he said, the girls were so beautiful, I knew they were Jewish girls. And so he listened to the conversation between the girl and his friend, SS, and the girl asked the man, will you shoot me after? And when he left, he asked his friend, you will shoot the girl? And he said, of course. So it was like that. It was a story that we cannot say so much, like we cannot transmit so much, because it's a story of criminals. And why Hitler could find people everywhere for that? Because when you brainwash people, when you make propaganda to designate a target, you wake up the criminals and you find clients for everything. So that's important today because we have to educate the young generation. Me, I'm a professor in Georgetown since eight years, and I see year after year that the students know nothing about Holocaust now, even the Jews. They know Hitler and Auschwitz, two names, and, and they would say in Hebrew, and that's it. So we have to teach everything, and I've chosen, because we don't accept now to swallow all the story of Himmler, Heydrich, and all that, the election of Hitler, we don't care. You must know, I don't teach in history. It's people who are studying terrorism or, or, or foreign affairs. So I try to teach them how they succeeded to kill Jews themselves, how the German arrive in time, finish in time, and make a killing. And for them, they are interested because they connect immediately to what they see in the TV because every day there are killings in the TV in your country or in any country. It's not finished and there are also hate crimes and anti-Semite crimes more and more in the news. And you know, now in the TV, they see a lot of emission like the Criminal Mind, X-File, etc. Where you see investigation, so they like to investigate. So when I teach, I begin by two points. I begin by making the list of countries where we don't teach Holocaust in high school, beginning by Mexico, Asia, China, India, Russia, most of African countries, most of Arab countries, etc. Even in Europe, we don't teach in Portugal, we don't teach in Croatia. We don't teach in Lithuania, and you don't teach in Estonia, 
etc., etc. And so suddenly they realize it's a small planet with teaching holocaust, and majority of the planet who denies it existed, more or less. So you cannot teach holocaust like you teach Napoleon. You know me, I'm French. Napoleon killed a lot of people, but nobody denies Napoleon. Nobody cares. I, don't, I never met a guy who denied Napoleon. But Holocaust, me, when I publish something on my Facebook, there's always somebody who denies it for any reason. So we cannot teach like if it was evident for all the planet it exists. You cannot teach a fact that is denied by 75% of the planet today. Because the young generation, they will have to carry that on their shoulders. No more survivor. Somebody who is 18 years old, he has very few lucks to meet a survivor now. So he will meet museum, he will meet, and he will meet people who say, ha, it never existed. It's a Jewish trick to make money to build Israel. I will never forget. The first time I went to a Holocaust Museum of Washington, I took a cab from the airport. I was new, I knew nothing. And the cab was Arab. And he, I gave the address. He brought me to the museum. And after, when I went to pay, he told me, you go to a place who shows a genocide that never existed. And he told me the V of freedom. I think we have to understand, we have to teach young generation will be a minority to admit that Holocaust existed and that Holocaust, unfortunately, is a reference today. Another point also that I would like to add is that perhaps there is Shoah fatigue, but there is no, in the planet, Hitler fatigue. Me, I work in Iraq. You can go in every store. You will find three, four books about Hitler and we are not against Hitler. I spoke everywhere in the planet. I had never to introduce Hitler. Everybody knows him. It's strange, they deny Holocaust, but they know he kills the Jews. And the other mass killers did not make their name. There is no book about Stalin. There is no book about Mao. There is no book about Pol Pot. Only Hitler. It will stay the brunt. And I think we have to know that for a young generation, there are many people in white aid group or in Islamist group who refer to Hitler as somebody really a mensch. And so we have to confront that because our young generation, sooner or later, will meet these people who don't only deny Holocaust but are proud of Hitler. Don't forget there are other meetings with young people who are trained in that way. So it's a strong responsibility today to teach, to train a generation of leaders, and to do it so that they are in capacity to resist to the huge movement of deniers, to the huge movement of hate, and also to be a minority carrying this memory. Let us not make like if it was the majority. I would like also to tell you but since we worked so long time about Holocaust, we found back the mass grave of nearly two million Jews, two time Auschwitz, that nobody remember, because there is nothing to see, there is no barbed wire, there is no camp, there is no railway, there are only empty fields, and empty synagogues were destroyed. And today, I work on other mass crimes. As you see, you saw I work in Iraq, I investigate about ISIS people through the Yazidi. ISIS, they never made a camp. They never made a camp. They make killings. They kill the people one by one, by shootings, by knife, by bombing. And that you must understand. Holocaust by bullets today, unfortunately, is a brand. I understood that a long time ago. I met a man in Poland, it was 25 years ago. His name was Stefan Vulkanovic. He told me, Patrick, Hitler made a mistake. I say, which mistake? He told me he built Auschwitz. And I asked him why it, it is a mistake for you. He told me because the Jews are coming back. When they kill them in forest, they never came back. 
And it took me years to understand. And that's pretty true. Even in Babiya, when they shot 33,000 Jews, it became a park with visitors, lovers, anything. They wanted even to make a supermarket in the park. Nobody cared. What, what is it to kill 33,000 Jews in a ravine because there is nothing to see? So as I say, the Jews say never again, and the mass killers say never again Auschwitz. Bashar al-Assad killed nearly half a million people, no Auschwitz. Rwanda, no Auschwitz. Darfur, no Auschwitz. Cambodia, no Auschwitz. And today, in Ukraine, no Auschwitz. So, we are also in a special period. For me, it's very special because one month ago, I was the, the director of the scientific committee of Babi Yar, and I was with the leader of the Museum of Babi Yar, visiting Israel. We met the President Herzog, we met the foreign minister, we met the chief of the Knesset, etc. Yad Vashem. And me, I smelt it will turn bad. And I said to my Ukrainian friends, you should leave the visit and go back to your country because the war will begin. And suddenly I woke up at 4 a.m. and I listened to Putin, making one hour, 20 minutes of topics, completely irreal, but declaring the war. So we decided, since Putin has done that, to investigate. My organization today investigates. We have interviewed by Zoom 37 Ukrainian victims of the Russian. I'm sad to say we have to give you news of what happened. There are three categories of victims today. I speak only about the civilian victim. The first category is families. When they saw that missiles were falling here and there, they decided to take their car and to go away. So they did that quickly. I remember I interviewed a woman. She was young. She was 30 years old. She was in an hospital. And she told me, we decided to take our car. I have my young boy, three years old, on my, uh, my, on my leg, and behind my two children, older, and my husband. And suddenly we turned, and we have been said to go back to the village, and suddenly the Russian shot to the car. She told me, I, f I understood immediately a bullet crossed the corpse of my three years child, and I turned back the head, and my teenager, 15 years old, was, was dead or so and my husband deeply injured. She has been extracted by the car, from the car by the neighbor she didn't know. She's in hospital, she could never get the corpse of her family. And it has been hundreds of times that, it's what you saw in the TV these last days, people who try to escape, try to take their car, and the Russians shoot, and you cannot take back the corpse. The second category is people who received the missile in their building, I interviewed a family, they were living at the 15th floor, and they were, they were willing not to go away and to stay in their apartment. And suddenly they heard a huge noise, they didn't even realize it was a missile, and she said, I opened the door of my child, her son was smashed in pieces, her daughter was also smashed in pieces, and her very injured, <coughs> and now I understand Bad news, she's in hospital, but the doctors made a mistake. They didn't see there was a piece of missile in her head, so she made a stroke. So that's the other kind of victim. The third kind of victims, very sad to say, is women and men who are raped. I interviewed somebody who is saving people. It's a, a, a lawyer. He saved already 115 people because he has a passport from Kazakhstan, so the Russian doesn't don't stop him. So he crossed the checkpoint, and he goes to save people, and he said that he saved eight girls who have been, uh, and women who have been raped. He said, he gave me an example, it was a girl 15 years old, and the, they were young soldiers of Russia before going to the fight, and they took the girl as a trophy. They wanted to rape her, the mother wanted to protect her girl, so they shot a bullet in the corpse of the mother. She was not dead, so they bent in there on a chair and they forced the mother to see her girl raped by 10 men multi-time. And the mother died like that without any healing. 
the girl, of course, is very damaged. So that was is happening today. And you will hear much more in the next weeks because if they liberate Mariupol, we know by the testimony that Mariupol is surrounded by mass graves and that minimum 3,000 to 500 dead. So why? Why it works like that? Why young soldiers coming from Russia, sometimes teenagers, young soldiers, are doing awful things in this century? In public, in broad daylight, under camera, with CNN, why Putin can deny every day he did it? We must not dream. Propaganda is still strong. Propaganda has the capacity to whitewash brain, and when people are brainwashed and drained against the population, any violence is possible like before. It's why we have to teach our young generation to see, be careful. Everybody can be a victim. Everybody can be a killer. It depends where you are. I always give this example. I don't know if you remember this American girl who was working in the jail of Abu Ghraib in Iraq. And we saw her in every TV because she was with naked men, mistreating them, and with a lot of pictures. She's in jail now. And I always say to my student that I'm sure she's a normal girl. I'm sure she's not a monster. But nobody told her, be careful. You will be a guard in a jail with no law. Perhaps we wake up in you somebody else that you don't know. So we have to learn from Holocaust who is a human being, his good capacity to heal people, to save people, but also his worst capacity to do the worst crimes when propaganda is coming. So I would like to thank you very much. I know that you are a center, I would say, preventing genocide. I can tell you, you can work quickly about Ukraine because we don't know until where Mr. Putin will go. It depends. And I hope he will not go there for the moment. We have crimes of war and crimes against humanity. Finally, I will finish by that. You know, many people ask me, what is doing your president? What is doing United Nations? When it was Trump, people who love Trump say, we love Trump, people who say, it's the fault of Trump. When I went in France, it's the fault of President Macron, or we love President Macron. When I was in Germany, Mrs. Merkel is the guilty one. I say it always to the people, don't forget, we will all die. And you know, in the Bible, the first question that God asked to Cain, who killed the devil, say, where is your brother? And Cain answered, am I the guardian of my brother? It means I have something else to do, you know, I'm life. And God says, don't you hear that the blood of evil is climbing from earth until heaven? And the commentary of Rashi say, not the blood, but the bloods, meaning all the people would be killed after. And I can tell you, when we will die, God will not ask you what was doing your president, what was doing United Nations. He will ask you, where is your brother? Thank you. Thank you, Father Dubois. What an inspiring and important way to kick off Genocide Awareness Week. Uh, if you have questions, please, the volunteers are collecting them. And I will start. I had questions emailed to me, and I will start with some of those. A high school teacher says that her students want to know how anyone can deny the Holocaust since it is the most documented genocide. 
how might this teacher, or really any of us, respond to students or Holocaust deniers? I mean, I think when you have a real Holocaust denier, you cannot say anything. You know, the first deniers were Himmler, Heydrich, and that. During Nuremberg, we say, we never did it. We never did it. All, all that is a fake history, and it has never existed. Me, I think what we must reach is the people who don't think anything about Holocaust. And to enlarge the circle of people who know what was the genocide, how it was handmade, how men, so many men took, and women took responsibility in that genocide. But to fight deniers, it's a lot of time. Because they hate the Jews. I never, find, I never met a denier who loves the Jews. <laughs> so it's very easy. And so it's a pretext, you know. And uh, one day they will criticize Israel, but even if Israel didn't exist, you know, they will criticize New York and I don't know, and the Rothschild and, and, and anybody else. So anti-Semitism was very strong before Israel existed. And uh, they critic Israel because there are Jews in Israel. But if there are no Jew in Israel, they will not criticize Israel. But don't take, lose your time with that, because uh, me, uh, I have deniers always who attack me. Me, when somebody attacks me on Facebook, I block him and he disappears. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like good advice. So I had three different questions submitted that all kind of are the um, similar theme. Um, after years of the type of work that you do, how do you keep a positive sense of humanity? And another very linked question is, how has doing this difficult, or has doing this difficult work robbed you of the ability to see beauty in the world and in people trying to make it better? I don't know. I, first, the first thing I, I mean, you must know, so I teach also. I'm not only investigating. And so I believe a lot in young generations. And uh, I have been professor since eight years in Georgetown, and my team is teaching in other universities in France or in America, or training high school teachers. And, you know, I am from Georgetown. So it's a very expensive university, as you know. And when they begin, half of them want to be bankers, and the other half want to be lawyers. And uh, I would say that people who follow my courses, because we, may, we bring them on the ground. We bring them in Moldavia, we bring them in Romania, in Poland, one week. Not uh, memory travel, but investigating travel. Me, I, I make them, you must understand my courses, I, I, I make them doubt about anything. I show them a, a picture of Auschwitz or about shooting, I say, do you think it's true? Do you think it's a fake picture? How you can know it's a real picture? Etc. Etc. So they learn to doubt and to give their own answers and not to repeat what I say. Because it's useless. Because they will meet after somebody who said it never existed. And so and when we bring them on the ground it's the same thing. We meet witnesses who are not Jews. Sometimes we're anti Jew. Sometimes we're present at the killing. And they, they learn how to address this question and to approach these people. And I would say a third of them choose to do something good in their life. It can be a state organization like FBI, etc., etc. It can be also big NGO. And I think you have a special quality in America that we don't have so much in Europe. I will give you an example. One of my students wanted to be FBI. And I knew he was from a wealthy family. So I say, surely your family is not agree because you will not make money like a banker. And he told me, opposite, my family is very proud, I will serve the country. And I see that always. So I think you have a quality that the families push the children to do really good, something good in their life, even if it's to sacrifice a certain level of money. That it doesn't exist in Europe. If you see a son of a banker in New York, if he wants to enter in police, surely the family will say, forget it, make banker, we'll see the next, uh, the next story. And so I think a huge capacity in America, among young people, but also with families, 
to, to, to do something well, because most of my students, I ask, why do you come to study Holocaust? It's a heavy course, of because I teach forensic of Holocaust, so really we are digging in all the senses. And uh, because all of them is a question, what can I do in my life? And I think I never saw such a quality of, even yes, this morning I was speaking to 800 high school boys and girls from Toledo, 15, 16, 17 years old. It was 9 a.m. So we surely left their place at 7.30, something like that. We arrived by bus. I was completely amazed by the good level of question they raised by themselves. So believe in your young people. Cultivate your young people. You, will, you, you, like any country, you need leaders. We see at every election, in every country, how we miss leaders. We have election in France in 10 days. It's a catastrophic situation. It will be the same people than last time. And so you must cultivate leaders, prepare them, because we will not be able to drive a good country without leaders. But you have the capacity in your young people. Thank you. Uh, very appropriate at, here at a university, so that message. And I see many professors here who uh, are teaching the students. So here's a question from somebody in the audience. Did you ever interview a shooter? And if so, was there guilt? It's always a question in America. Everybody asks me about guilt. <laughs> <laughs> guilt and confession. It will be the next question. Do I confess them? <laughs> so first, if people are not Catholic, I must explain that I cannot confess people with a camera and 11 person around, because it will be legal confession because confession is secret. Uh, I interviewed killers. I interviewed a man in Romania. He has shot himself 223 Jews. I knew it from the neighbors. I was afraid he will not accept to do it, to say it. I made a very long interview. And in the middle, I say, are you sure, sir, you kill them, the Jews, yourself? He say, what do you think? It was me. I had the highest rank. It was me. And I say, how do you sure you kill more than 200 Jews? He says, because I needed three boxes of bullets. And each box is 100 bullets. And that's it. And he was very proud. The problem is that the neighbors have put benches to listen to the testimony because he was the hero of the village. You must know that in the law, if you are in a unit of militaries, if you shoot Jews, etc., you are not guilty. Because you will advocate you, had, you were under order. So in Babi Yar, there were 2,000 German involved in the shootings. Five have been judged only among 2,000. So you must understand it's why Holocaust by bullet is a catastrophe, because we all know it. They know when they are in ISIS. They know that now the Russian, it will be the same problem. And we will try to, I cannot divulgate what we are doing, but we'll try to cooperate with other organizations to know who was really in charge of raping this woman, of taking this belonging, etc. So, but it's a big challenge because they will find lawyers to say, oh, it was not myself, I had a boss, I did what I was asked to do. If you are guard in Auschwitz, you can be judged in Germany. If you are shooter, you cannot be judged. I say that because imagine how many, how thousands and thousands of Germans were shooting. Two million, it means two million bullets. It's why you cannot have big trials of shooters. I, so I, I met many shooters, but the, the biggest one was this Romanian guy. And you know, he was very old, and it was terrible because we don't say what we think, so he doesn't know if we were anti-Jew or pro-Jew. And at the end, he woke me, he knew I was a priest, he woke me at the door and said, I wish you long life, Father. So you mentioned the number two million. In your first book, it was less. It yep. was 1.5, maybe. So do you believe the number six million Jewish people people murdered during the Holocaust is accurate? Or from your research, do you believe the true number is higher? It's a complicated question, because the six million don't think that somebody was with a computer in Berlin and say, up, six, done, finished. 
this number has been uh, established in a so-so way. If I gave all your details, you would laugh even because there was somebody drunk in the meeting. And so it will be much more Jews that was said. Why? Because in Russia, in Soviet Union, Jews were refugees. Its people could not escape to Palestine, to France, and that. They took a train east, and they couldn't go where they wanted because it was Soviet regime. So the Soviet Union, sometimes they could arrive to Tashkent, to Uzbekistan, to that. But most of them, no. They, could, they would put in a farm, in a village, and when the Germans arrived, they were administration, they were, who are the foreigners? They got the list and they killed them. All these Jews have never been counted. Because also the Russian Jews say it's not our Jews. So, for example, in a city like Krasnodar, who is in, in Russia today, 30,000 people killed, only in one city. And so we, we finished all the mass graves of Russia. Don't misunderstand, the last mass graves are near Baku, in Azerbaijan. They went very far. And also in the suburb of Moscow, 17 kilometers, the last mass grave. So if you land in Moscow, who don't land in Moscow actually, but if you land in Moscow, in case, uh, between the airport and the center, there are mass graves. But who knows it? Who knows it? And so the problem is that also in the mass grave, who are on the territory of Russia today in Belarus, it's not, you cannot write Jew. You write innocent civilian. So it's complicated because in Soviet Union it was a taboo to say there were Jews. In Krasnodar, by example, 30, more than 30,000 victims, the rabbi put a small signal that we were Jews, it has been taken out the same day. It's why we cannot... Uh, it's complicated because people never studied East. Unconsciently, we valorized the West because it was nearer from us. And also because during the Soviet Union, we could not know what happened there. So when we built our museums, our books and that, it was bit before 91, and we wrote what we could write. I have a little different of a question. What is your opinion or thoughts about the rising anti-Semitism in France? It's not only in France. It's also in Germany, it's also in Norway, etc. It's where there are Jews. People, f f it depends if I speak to you politically correct or the reality. Politically correct, we are far from Holocaust. So the taboo of Holocaust is finished. So before, we couldn't say we don't like the Jews because people were accused to be Nazi. Now, in many places, you couldn't say you like the Jews because you are accused to be a Zionist. So it reversed completely. The, the People feel free of Hitler now. They say, OK, we paid the bill, so many years, commemoration, ceremony, and that. OK, now it's far. We can say we didn't like the Jews. We don't like the Jews. First thing. So the freedom of speech in our country well, doesn't exist. We have no freedom of speech in the law in France. We are not America. So if you're anti-Semite, you can be arrested in France. But in private meeting, and, uh, it's very in fashion to say on the Jews. For example, me, when I appeared, uh, and I was very supported by, by the Jewish community in my books and that, many people wrote in the newspaper, is supported by the Jews, so it cannot be clear. So it's to see where we are. But since 15 years, we have Jews killed in France. The first one was Ilan Alimi, uh, when he was a young boy, he has been trapped by a girl who gave an appointment. In fact, he was arrested by a gang. They tortured him during three weeks, and uh, they burned him nearly completely. And when they liberated, he was, he was uh, dying, burned, naked, and he died. And we went in the street. We were 15,000 people, and even the Cardinal of Paris, but he was Jew, he was Cardinal Lustiger, were in the street, and all the government and all the opposition were in the street. Today, they kill a Jew, don't try to make a demonstration in the street, because it's every year. So, but all the Jews in France have been killed by Islamists. I don't say that all the Muslims are killers, but all the killers are Muslim. 
So actually, in our society, there is a more and more gap with opening. It's why the election will arrive in a few in 10 days. The key question will be that. So I hope Macron will be elected. But there are 41% who vote ultra-right. With the key argument, we, are, we vote ultra-right with Mrs. Le Pen and that extreme right, because and the key argument are the Muslims. So it's complicated, complicated, complicated. But, and it touch your life, your private life. Me, I, I, my, our office in Paris, or not in Paris, it's five minutes from Paris, but it's a place of what you call in America gentrification. It doesn't exist in my country, this term, but I learned it here. And, um, but we are security, we have a big place with walls, protection and that. One day I came back to my, uh, I was in Brussels, I think, I came back from a meeting, my luggage arrived, and I am, uh, it's a, I am in an alley with no car, very nice, with flowers and that. Two policemen were in my door, they say, Father Patrick, we ask you now not to sleep in your apartment, it's too dangerous, because in a few days there is a ca Catholic feast, and we think that can be Islamist attack. So we ask you to sleep in an hotel during three, four, five weeks. You imagine, I was, I'm French. I had to leave apartment, to live in a fancy area in the center of Paris when there is no Arab, because that's a question. And like a tourist during five weeks. And after, when I came back, police came two times per day, checking my apartment and checking if I am okay. I, have a, I lose a lot of money to pay security on my apartment, the same security that the people who are selling diamonds in the center of Paris. It's not a normal situation. But me, I'm not an anti-Muslim. I work in Iraq. My bodyguards are Muslim. I work with the government, etc., etc. But radical Muslim, me, if they, if they catch me, they will kill me. That's for sure. Imagine, I met people from intelligence in my area, simple people, and they told me, uh, in one street near to you, there is one radical Muslim uh, that is uh, under survey, so if you could avoid this, that street. So, we are, you, we are the real situation. If you are wealthy, in a wealthy, you will not see it. But if you are a normal person, you are confronted to that always. This week, I appeared a new case, it's a Jew who was a young Jew with a kippah, and he was in a subway, and it seems three bad guys run after him. So when you say bad guys, it's always for us the same group. And he ran, and he was killed by the, by, the, by the subway. And now we begin to understand it was not normal. They were running after a Jew in a subway station, and it will be classified as anti-Semite. And so we are really in a situation that is not easy. You must know also that we have a lot of Jews who left France to go to Israel or so. Some of them may make Aliyah to Miami, but it's easier. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> so, but uh, I say that because, and it's a permanent topic. There is no Jewish family, with, even the most wealthy, who don't speak about leaving the country. Because of that. So, but I'm not an anti-Muslim, I say that, I don't want to be used in that way, I'm not an anti-Muslim, I, I will vote Macron, I will not vote for the ultra-right of Mrs. Le Pen, but there is a question. And where you live in a country with mix, you have always to be careful at every moment. For example, me, my apartment, I have chosen an apartment with seven minutes walking to my office. Since two years, I don't go on foot from my apartment, to the office, I take an Uber. It's to tell you where we are, actually, and which security, and I hope it will not happen to you, because I see that violence is beginning to pop in certain parts of America, like Brooklyn or other places, and I, it was like that at the beginning. It was a little bit funny when you say, oh, it's Orthodox Jews, it's why, because they are big hats that they are kicked. Me, I have no hat, so it's okay. But now, we don't care. And so I hope it will not come. But I can tell you, uh, be careful, don't become like us, because when it's like that, it's too late. It was a meeting like that in Paris, we would like to have an army at the door, because there is no meeting with Jews without army. That's the situation. And we are one of the best countries with millions of tourists, nice country, you can visit everything, you will not see anything, as long as you don't go one kilometer from the center of Paris.
Well, we're going to have to wrap up, but I, you talked about the work of Yahad Adunam and you started work, your work on covering what happened during the Holocaust and then you've done similar work in Iraq and Guatemala. Unfortunately, genocides have not stopped. What is next for Yahad? For me, first is to, to make that my legacy exists. By example, we are looking for more financial support for the Museum of Guatemala. People don't realize Guatemala is millions of children who know nothing. And when the anti-Semitic groups are trying to catch them, to say you are poor because there are rich Jews in America, blah, 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 blah. And so we have to educate these people against hate, anti-Semitism, and that. And uh, uh, you know, when I, we, we did this museum in Guatemala, in Guatemala, people say, why in Guatemala? I say, of course, if I built the first museum in Paris, everybody would be happy. But it's not to make a museum in every city of France that will change the situation. We have to, and I am a guy, so I try to do what the Jews will not do. So, uh, so I try to choose projects that nobody will, pro will, will, project, will do. So there are two things I would dream to transmit. First, we built a special methodology of investigation by interviewing the non-Jews, the spectators, the neighbors, and also the archives and so on, to establish evidence of the crimes committed by the German. I think we have to transmit this model of investigation to different universities, but it can be transmitted to students. Because I see the students I train in Georgetown who are trained in other universities of France, they change their mind because they become investigators about the Holocaust, so they are investigating in general, and they have the capacity to answer to any question, because they don't repeat Jews have been killed. They learn what is not evident, not evident, etc. For example, I show pictures of Jews walking with stars on their back, and I say, it's written they would be killed. Are you sure? I say, for a denial, you say no. They are transported in another city. There is no sign of guns. So they learn how to confront sources and to make their mind. So I think we have built something with a kind of certification of model of investigation by the neighbors. It's why now we can do that in Ukraine of today. And so that's the first thing. The second thing, we have to finish our investigation about the Holocaust. It's more two years, and it's not easy to raise money to finish because people say, oh, it's a long time. And I want to finish to find the last mass grave we can find. It will not be Russia, Ukraine, of course, but Poland, you must understand, there is one mass grave in every village. In every village. Around Sobibor, I found 223 mass graves. Shot. And that nobody visits, and nobody will go. Near Auschwitz, we found a mass grave with 4,500 Jews. Shot. So when we bring now people in Auschwitz, we visit the camp, and after we go to see the mass grave out of the camp. And we speak with the farmers of Poland who explain. I will never forget, I had a group of Haredi Jews from America, very religious, and they wanted to make a visit, so we did it, etc. It was very moving because we said Kaddish everywhere. And uh, we were in a place with uh, like 10 mass graves near Auschwitz. And a farmer came to help us to understand. And suddenly the farmer say, here is a mass grave of Jewish babies, only babies. And uh, the Jews from New York asked him, how do you know there are babies in this mass grave? He said, because I put them myself. And so I say that because suddenly Holocaust is a crime committed by people that they can touch, that they can discuss with. It's not uh, something that happened in the past. And uh, I think we must transmit that as a crime story. But my, my, my dream is the legacy. And the, other, the last thing, is what we do actually in Ukraine. You know, I was in Israel with this delegation of Babiyar. They left the day before Putin declared the war. And one of my best friends is the number two of Babiyar. His name is Ruslan, he's the vice director. He's Ukrainian, he's Christian. And uh, he left Israel, he, he wanted to take a flight to go to, to save his family. And uh, I will never forget, he, he asked me, Patrick, you will come for our mass graves? A note to end on. What an incredible um, evening. It was difficult 
topic. Uh, I think everybody here will join me in saying we thank you so much for your dedication. And I, I will say last thing before you say thank you. I will say, I will say, I was one day. It was in uh, Los Angeles. It was with uh, the Visental Center. It was very funny because I will not give you the detail, but they asked me, "Don't speak because you will destroy the evening." So I say, <laughs> I say, if I don't speak, I leave the ceremony. So, so I spoke, and it was a show, you know, it was Brad Pitt and all these people. And so uh, after, after me was the, the owner of Sony, she told me, what do I have to say? Me? <laughs> and, but, but it was not the question. When we finished, it was a big uh, waiting list because everybody has a limousine and nobody could find his limousine. And so, uh, and a lady approached me and she told me, I heard you speaking yesterday, Father, and I couldn't sleep. I say, perhaps, ma'am, it's the first time, you, first time you are conscient. And so I say, after my conference of today, or perhaps the days before, if you don't sleep well, you are very welcome to work with me. Thank you so much. And I want to thank you, that lady. Tomorrow morning, 10.30, Father, will, Father Patrick will speak again. He'll speak a little more about the Yazidis and ISIS. Um, so please, I welcome you to come back. If you've brought a book or want to buy one of Father Dubois' book, please give him a moment, and he's going to be in the back of the room. And if you did not get your parking ticket validated, uh, the table outside of this room, you can get them validated. So thank you all.